In this lecture, we will introduce the idea of serial communication and specifically how to do so with the PIC 16F887. This is a first in two lectures. This one will talk generically about serial communication and could work for both a wired and a wireless interface. And then the next lecture will involve using this with an XB Wi-Fi chip to wirelessly transmit serial data. So how does serial data transmission work? Well, what it does is it sends a single bit, one at a time, across a data line. And it does this very, very quickly um, so that you can send a lot of data in a short amount of time. But it really minimizes the hardware that's necessary because you only have one single data line to transmit all of your data. And that data rate is managed by a clock. So what you want to do is send out data at a fixed rate so that it can be received on the other end at a fixed rate. And this is used in a variety of technology, including any USB device that you may have, including internet technology, all sorts of communication technology, utilizes serial data transmission. Serial data transmission can be either full duplex or half duplex. What that means is if you're in full duplex mode, you can both send and receive at the same time. You can think about that being like a telephone. So on a telephone, you can hear the other person, they can hear you, and actually you can speak simultaneously at, uh, one to another. So you can actually have one person talking over the other person, things like that. Generally in civil conversation, we of course uh, only speak one at a time, but you can actually hear the other person on the other end while you're communicating. The opposite of that is half duplex where you can only send or receive at a time. You could be both a sender and a receiver, but you can only do one at a time. And the example there is a walkie talkie or some of the phones that were around several years ago that had the push to talk feature where you could only send information or receive information, but you could not do both. And this is generally what is used in early USB devices but we do now with the advent of USB 3.0 have full duplex capability with USB peripherals. So speaking of USB, let's go through a little bit of a history on the universal serial bus or USB. It really started emerging in the late 90s. Um, Intel was the first to have integrated circuits that supported USB in 1995. Um, I had a laptop in 1999 that had a single USB port. Now it is, of course, very pervasive, and most laptops have multiple USB ports. Early USB ports, USB 1.0, was fairly slow, uh, 1.5, and then went up to full speed at 12 megabits per second. Um, and then the speed gradually increased. USB 2.0 really achieved fairly high data rates around the turn of the century. Uh, up to about 480 megabits per second and now we have USB 3.0 as the emergent standard and it can get 5 or 10 gigabits per second which really is quite good for data transmission to external hard drives, video transmission, all those types of things. So let's talk a little bit about the differences. So really going from USB 1 to 2 was not that much different, really it was uh, a matter of data speed, but there was a significant change when we got into USB 3.0. So USB 2.0 and earlier, those devices just have four pins. You can generally tell by the color of the USB port, whether it's USB 1, 2, or 3. 1 was typically white, uh, 2 was black, and 3 is blue. Um, inside of the cable, if you were to ever cut open a USB data cable, you would see four wires in there. One is your five volts, typically it's red, it sometimes comes in orange, and this is how people are using USB to really power and charge batteries on external devices like cell phones and iPods and all sorts of other peripherals, is because you do have a five volt supply and of course a ground reference um, that can an enable you to send uh, fairly low current signals but enough to charge a small lithium ion battery. And so the VCC is your power signal and then you have two data lines, uh, data minus and data plus. And they are actually just complements of one another. They're generally sent that way just for redundancy to make sure that you don't have any errors in your transmission line. So 
your plus and your minus ought to be exactly the opposite of one another. If you're sending a bit one on the plus, you ought to be sending a bit zero on the minus. And if that is ever not the case, then you know that you have an error in your transmission. But in this case, you have just half duplex transmission. And so peripheral devices, of course, can both send and receive. So if you're talking about a USB printer, you generally are sending information to the printer, but you can also get some information back. So the printer might send an error message such as I'm out of ink or I'm out of paper, or something along those lines. So you do need the ability to be both a transmitter and a receiver, um, but you cannot be that at the same time. So generally you might send a data packet or several data packets and then check to see if you have any error packages coming back error packets coming back from the peripheral, those types of things. So um, you are generally sending most of the time with USB, but you also may be receiving. USB 3.0 actually added several more ports, and so now you can actually be in full duplex. You can both send and receive data simultaneously. It is backwards compatible with USB 2.0, but of course it will be slower if you put a USB 3.0 uh, peripheral into a USB 2.0 uh, port, but this does allow for simultaneous data transmission and reception. And because you have these added pins, you can actually uh, double down on sending of data and really send across multiple pins at the same time, and so that speeds things up. SATA technology is also uh, rather prevalent, especially when it comes to connecting hard disks and optical drives, which although optical drives are sort of on their way out, I would see, it would seem. Um, but SATA stands for Serial Advanced Technology Attachment. And these really came on to the market in the early to mid 2000s, uh, about 2003. And they have, of course, added speed as we've gone through. And so generally, these are used inside of computers. So you might see a small SATA cable which is really about half an inch to three quarters of an inch wide, fairly thin. And it's quite nice because it replaced the old IDE ribbon cables, which were about two inches wide, took up a lot more space. And so now you can send and receive data across these SATA cables. And there's also eSATA, or eSATA, if you are talking to external devices. So that might connect an external hard drive or something along those lines. So. Now that we've talked generically about how serial transmission works and the idea of half duplex and full duplex, the idea of sending data one bit at a time, let's see how it works with the PIC we've been using in this course. The PIC we've been using, the PIC16F887, actually has several different modes that you can use for serial communication. The one we're going to use in this class is called the USART, or Enhanced Universal Synchronous Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. And so there's a lot packaged in there, uh, in that name. You can actually use it in both a synchronous and an asynchronous mode, which gets into whether you are synchronized to the clock of the PIC, or if you have a separate clock for um, sending and receiving your data. And also, since it's a, both a receiver and a transmitter, that means that you do have bi-directional uh, data transmit and receive capability. Uh, before you really get into that in the lab this week, I would suggest you read over thoroughly section 12 of the data sheet, which starts on page 155. I'm going to help you unpack some of the registers and bits that you're going to be dealing with in doing that, but I would suggest a thorough read of section 12 before the lab this week. Let's look at the transmitter module. There's several different registers involved in there. And over here, what you see are some of the bits and registers that are involved in generating the clock for the data transmission. And so different data is transmitted at different rates. It just depends upon what type of device you're talking to and uh, what the expected data transmission rate is. And you can actually set up the baud rate over here, that is your transmission clock rate, using some multipliers of the, uh, the system clock. So you've got FOSC we've seen before when we were talking about timers. And so you can actually get the frequency of the oscillator. You've got multipliers in here. And depending upon whether you're in synchronous or asynchronous mode, and depending upon whether you're going to be using two byte or just one byte, 
baud rate generation you can configure that we'll get into a little bit more detail of exactly how that works the TX reg register is where you put all of the data that you want to send one byte at a time so you put a byte of data into the TX reg register and then it gets put down into what's called the transmit shift register the TSR and what happens is that data comes in there and then it gets sent out one bit at a time out of the least significant bit so it effectively is a rotate right and then that data gets sent over the TX pin and so in your trainer kits there actually is a pin labeled TX that you can access and so we'll talk about what port that's connected to in a little bit later slide the receive module is pretty much the exact opposite you still have the uh, baud rate generation basically the same in this case you've got your uh, your configuration here and you can you have your RX pin and that's gonna buffer some of the data it comes in through a receive shift register and then once it's all ready and the data can be read your data is available in the RC reg um, you may notice that there's this extra RX 9 and we also saw that in the previous slide there is the TX9 in here you have the option of sending or receiving either 8-bit data or 9-bit data in our case we're just going to use 8-bit data throughout so you don't have to worry too much about that other than just to choose to not use that you also have the option of doing a continuous receive and that's what we're going to do um, using the CREN bit so that's basically just going to be continuously listening for any data that may come across the uh, the serial channel here and so that way we're going to make sure we listen for any data that's intended for us so the baud rate how do we determine how fast we send or receive data well we can either use 8 or 16 bits for that and so we're going to use 8 which means our BRG 16 that's short for a baud rate generator 16 in our baud control register is determining whether you have 16 bits to control the baud rate or simply 8. We don't need full 16 bit control for our application. We're just going to use 8. So we're going to clear our BRG 16 bit. So the formulas for the different baud rate generation is in table 12.3. I would direct you to that in your data sheet. But for our purposes, what we're going to do is we're going to clear BRGH, BRG16, and the sync bit. So BRGH, if it's set, that allows for higher speed baud rate, which we really don't need for what we're doing. Um, BRG16 allows for 16 bit. We're not going to use that. We're just going to use 8 bit. And then the sync stands for uh, either synchronous or asynchronous mode. If you're using asynchronous mode, you put zero in there. If you're using synchronous mode, you put a one. And we're going to be doing asynchronous, so we're going to put a zero right there. And then beyond that, your baud rate is determined by the frequency of your oscillator. In our case, that's going to be four megahertz divided by 64 times n plus one, where n is the value that you put into the SPBRG register. And so we'll talk a little bit later about what specific baud rates we need to put in to send data across. Um, so just remember the frequency of our oscillator is 4 million for this 4 megahertz. The different pins, we're going to be using port C, bit 6 and 7 to send and receive. Transmission is on RC6 or the TX pin and receive is on RC7 or the RX pin. So you want to make sure if you're doing uh, sending and receiving that you do in your Tris C register set up your TX pin that is RC6 as an output and your RX pin as an input also since you know that your uh, keypad was also on RC2 you want to make sure all the switches on your keypad are in fact turned off for any labs that involve serial data communication the TX STA register is where a lot of the transmission control happens. It's called the transmit status and control. And so this is where you're going to set up all of the options for transmitting data for your transmitter if you're going to send any data. And so bit seven, we don't really care about that if we're in asynchronous mode. So you can ignore that or just put a zero. TX9 is bit six. That is if you're going to transmit nine bits, we're only going to transmit eight at a time. So you're going to need to make sure that bit is a zero. 
And then in bit four, that is your sync bit. If you're using synchronous mode, uh, you would put that to a one. We're just gonna be using asynchronous, so you can set that to zero. And then bit three is the send B. That allows you to send a break uh, between data transmission. We're just gonna keep plowing through and sending more data. So we're not going to send a break bit or a, a break signal through there. So we're gonna set that to zero. BRGH, as I already mentioned, is for higher baud rates. We're gonna set that to zero. And TRMT is a bit that says the transmit shift register is empty, which basically means that uh, the transmit is done versus the uh, bit being zero means that the transmit shift register is full or that a transmission has not finished. And then if you do transmit uh, nine bits, you can only put eight bits into the uh, transmit register, but the ninth bit goes in this TX9D, which would be bit zero. But we're not gonna worry about that because we're not transmitting a ninth bit. I just wanted you to understand if you wanted to send nine bits, you could um, by putting that ninth bit here in TX9D. And that would be the most significant bit that you are transmitting. So TX reg is what holds the data to be transmitted. That's the 8-bit register where we're going to send out information and then that gets copied over to the TSR and as I mentioned before just gets pushed out least significant bit at a time, effectively rotated right out through the data transmit pin and it gets shifted at whatever rate you set up the baud rate to be. RC reg is on your receiver. That's where your receive data comes in and so there your serial data that has come into the receiver is held until you read it. So let's look at the order of operations for a transmitter. You're going to have to first set up your baud rate and you can use all the registers and bits that we already talked about. Um, SPBRGH is if you were using 16-bit we're not going to be using that. SPBRG is what we will be using. BRGH, remember again we said for our application we're going to set that to zero, also BRG16 we're going to set to zero. Then you're going to enable the serial port in asynchronous mode. So you're going to clear sync which puts us in asynchronous mode and then you're going to set SPEN which does enable the serial port. That stands for serial port enable. Then you're going to make sure you're in 8-bit mode. Just clear out your TX9 and then you can set the TXEN bit which enables transmission. Then you're going to put whatever value you want to send into TX reg and you're just going to keep doing that over and over again while you wait for all of the bytes to be transmitted. So that's how you make a basic transmitter is just setting up a baud rate, do, configuring a few bits and registers there for that baud rate and what mode you want and then you just continue to transmit data using the TX reg. In order to receive, you set up the baud rate the exact same way as the transmitter. You still want to enable the serial port by setting SPEN and then you're still going to want to be in asynchronous mode, so same thing there with your sync bit. We're not going to be receiving 9 bits, so make sure that is cleared. That way it'll work with our 8-bit transmitter as well. And then you want to continuously receive, so you will set the CREN bit, and that will allow us to just continuously pull in each of the bits of data that come across our channel and process them accordingly. So there are several ways that we can work with receiving. You can use interrupts. For our application, we're just going to do polling just to make sure we don't do anything else that might change anything while we're receiving it. So you can put in a while not RCIF, that exclamation point is there for not, so that flag will go back low uh, once your receive is done. And so then um, you're ready to read the data, and so you can pull it in from RC reg. So you're just going to do a hard wait for the RCIF to go back down low. And then once you get that data, RC reg is going to hold it and you can move that over to whatever variable, whatever you need to do to process that data.